Good morning. I'm Stephen Romo. And I'm Valerie Castro. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, desperate search. This morning, a massive rescue operation is underway near the site of one of the worst ocean disasters of the 20th century. A submersible carrying five people on a trip to see the Titanic vanished after losing contact with the surface. We understood that that was uh, 96 hours of uh, rescue uh, cap or emergency capability. Uh, we anticipate that there's somewhere between uh, 70 to uh, uh, the full 96 hours available at this point. We have team coverage this morning of the search underway as rescuers race against the clock. Extreme weather urgent emergency. This morning, millions of people in the south are waking up to the risk of severe storms again. The region already reeling after a deadly system swept through, flooding roads, splintering homes, and leaving hundreds of thousands without power. We're tracking the forecast and also the potentially dangerous heat wave that's moving in. New insight into Ukraine's counteroffensive. We're getting a new look at the brutality behind Ukraine's trench to trench push to force Russian troops out of their country. Just ahead, the latest on the new American aid coming to the fight and the major difference it could make. And life after influencing. After more than a decade living out her life online, one influencer with millions of followers has decided to pull the plug, and she's not alone. New this morning, what she's telling us about her decision to give up influencing and start something new. Hmm, interesting. I love a good social media break. So Recovering to, influencer, it sounds like. Dig into that one. All right. Well, we start this morning with a major story happening right now, a race against time in the North Atlantic. Yeah, scary stuff here. A massive and urgent search happening right now to find a missing research submersible with five people on board. That group was scheduled to dive up to 13,000 feet underwater to get up and close, an up-close look, rather, with the wreckage of the Titanic on Sunday. But less than two hours into that mission, all contact was lost. This morning, the Coast Guard is leading a search in a remote area 900 miles off the coast of Massachusetts. It is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. The U.S. Coast Guard has deployed C-130 search planes and has also called in help from both the U.S. and Canadian Navy, as well as some private companies. Now, this search made it more urgent because the vessel only has enough oxygen to support that crew for a little more than 90 hours and a little more than three and a half days total, meaning they could run out of air by as soon as tomorrow evening. In just a moment, we'll talk to U.S. Navy Captain David Marquet, who commanded a nuclear submarine, about what the rescue operation may look like, but we start with NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren in Boston with the latest on this search. Good morning to you, Kristen. So what's the latest this morning on that search, and what more do we know about this Titan submersible? Right. Good morning, Stephen. Well, we're actually here uh, at the Coast Guard Station in Boston where they are sending and have been sending uh, these ships out to try and get to the Titanic site. But as you said, 900 miles off the coast of Cape Cod, so quite far out. We know that the Titan submersible was headed to the Titanic uh, wreck that hasn't been heard from since Sunday. This is a submersible, so it needs a mothership. It, it goes along with the ship. Uh, it uses a Starlink satellite to communicate with the submersible using text messages. It uh, last was heard from on Sunday, so at quite a depth. This is made of titanium and carbon fiber. It weighs about 21,000 pounds and measures 22 feet by 9.2 feet by 8.3 feet. So I heard it described as about the size of a minivan. I actually just spoke with my uh, brother, who's a marine biologist, works in the Bahamas, and had seen it because he's been talking with Stockton Rush as they were doing the testing of this vehicle in the Bahamas. He said it's really quite small when you see it uh, up close. And so the rescue operations still running at this point, searching for any sign of the submersible, Stephen. And Christian, hearing about the size of it makes it all the more scary to think about the people on board. And you mentioned Stockton Rush. Last year, we interviewed him, the CEO of Ocean Gate, which owns the Titan. Here's what he said about the selection and training process of those involved. 
we have an interview process. So you sign up. Uh, we have to make sure that people are uh, healthy enough and physically fit. You need to be able to climb a ladder, and it's not, not a huge physical requirement. But it's more important that people understand this is a real expedition. We have you know all kinds of challenges, not just weather, but equipment. Uh, and then once we've uh, accepted the person into the program, uh, they can they can pay to join. And then there's a lot of training that goes on. No one is just a tourist. So, Christian, what more do we know about this company and what it takes to get a spot on these missions aside from the money, which Stockton just mentioned there? <laughs> Right. And, you know, it's it's quite exclusive, quite expensive. Uh, fewer people have gone down to this depth than have actually been in space. So it's the commitment of the time that they do the training and also that two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar price tag in order to get on this mission. Uh, they do consider everybody a part of the crew and do some some minimal training. But it's really, you know, the pilot and the crew members uh, that would do any type of like emergency. Uh, evacuation or anything like that and it's interesting because they're actually like bolted into this uh, it goes onto a float and they are screwed in there is no way to get out once you are inside that is the crew from that from that uh, ship on board that would have to get them out uh, and you know this rescue is so difficult compounded by the fact that even Navy submarines aren't believed to be able to go down to that depth so if there were some type of rescue, it would have to be with a drone, with an unmanned craft, uh, which the Navy does have something that could work like that, but getting it even to that location is complicated. So a really complex rescue operation at this point. So many logistical problems, including those bolts being on the outside of that vessel. And we were talking about the people on board. Do we know who they are? What more do we know about them? Yeah, and we're learning more about them. So we do have uh, a British explorer, Hamish Harding. Uh, his team has confirmed that he's on board. You know, he's an adventurer. He went uh, on the Blue Origin spacecraft uh, and so does these sort of extreme expeditions. Also, a Pakistani uh, businessman and his son are on board. And then it's believed that uh, Stockton Rush, the CEO of Ocean Gate, on board, as well as somebody else who works with the company. All right, Kristen Dogman, I'm following the latest for this. Thanks so much, Kristen. Now for more on this, let's bring in David Marquette. He is a retired U.S. Navy captain for his perspective and author of the book, Turn the Ship Around. David, good morning, and thank you for joining us. You have served as the commander of a nuclear submarine. Can you start by explaining what a rescue like this would even look like? Yeah, I think there's two main steps. One, find the ship. To bring it up to the surface. I'm assuming that the ship is on the bottom. That's why we haven't found it so far. Finding a small submarine like that is very, very difficult. It's in and among the Titanic and the debris field of the Titanic. As Kristen said, it's about the size of a minibus. And if they are not being active and banging and making some sort of noises or it might have a pinger, then we have to locate it using high um, frequency, high fidelity sonar. So that's going to be hard, number one. Number two, we got to get it up to the surface because, again, as Kristen said, the people are bolted in and we can't mate another ship to it. We need to get it to the surface so we can take those bolts off and get those people out of the submarine. All this before the oxygen runs out and we're about halfway through how much oxygen we think they might have. All right, the, the clock is ticking. Uh, this missing vessel, we're told, is a submersible, not a submarine. What is, what is the difference between the two and does that change their chance for survival? Uh, not really. A submersible and a submarine both are designed to go underwater and stay underwater. This has small propellers, so it can do, a, can do maneuvering around a, um, a site location, but it can't leave port, drive out to sea. It, it can't make its way out to the Titanic on its own. It gets towed out there by a mothership, which then stays in the vicinity and, and watches and supervises what's happening. It really needs that other team up on the surface. Ocean Gate submersible Titan can reach about 13,000 feet. We're told the Navy's deep diving rescue vehicles can only reach depths of about 2,000 feet. In your opinion, is a rescue still possible at this point? I think it's possible. I, I mean, the Chilean miners were found and 
the boys came out of the cave and sometimes miracles happen, but I think the odds are, are pretty low and they're getting lower all the time. We got to find them first. All right, Captain David Marquette, we appreciate you weighing in on this. Thank you so much. All right, now to the severe weather that has been sweeping across the country and causing some major damage along the way. Record-breaking heat and tornadoes, just some of the conditions facing residents in the southeast this morning. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has more from Mississippi. Well, Stephen and Valerie, good morning to you both. Right now, I'm in Lewin, Mississippi. We're about an hour, 15 minutes outside of Jackson. And let me just show you, this is the power of these storms. This is a trailer, a tractor trailer. You can see it right here on its side. What's remarkable, though, a gentleman who lives in this area tells us this trailer was clear over there. It was further down the road from where I'm standing, and it was thrown here, came to a rest. All along this street and a couple of streets up, you see devastation like this. You see homes that are unrecognized just mangled cars and pieces of trees that have been completely twisted apart. This is the same storm system, the same front that has been blowing across the plains and across the south over the past four days, making at least 17 reported tornadoes, claiming six lives. And officials say that they are still working to determine if some of these spots are tornadoes. So it's, there's a possibility that this number could rise. Now, guys, of course, we're talking about the severe weather, but there is also rain. There's also also flooding that we're seeing in parts of Alabama, parts of Miami that grounded a number of flights at the airport there yesterday. And then on top of that, almost adding insult to injury, we're talking about heat, record highs, in fact, reaching triple digit highs in some of the very places where people are still trying to clean up in places like this. So there are hundreds of thousands of people across the south this morning that are still without power as temperatures are expected to climb to near record highs again, all of it making the cleanup here much more difficult. Guys, back to you. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you. Now let's bring in meteorologist Angie Lastman for more on the latest on those storms that could be headed your way. A lot going on, Angie. Yeah, a lot going on indeed. Let's start with the severe threat today because we still have 5 million people under that severe threat, mainly focused towards the Gulf Coast. It does include major cities like New Orleans, though, Alexandria, Lake Charles, all included in that. In that. The hazards look to be mainly hail and strong winds. Those wind gusts could be upwards of 60 miles per hour. The tornado threat isn't zero, but it's low. So we'll keep an eye on maybe an isolated tornado or two, but it's mainly going to be the wind and the hail. Now, as far as the heavy rain is concerned, that's mostly going to focus towards the eastern half of the country. We'll see the southeast picking up anywhere from maybe one to three inches in a widespread area, but localized spots could pick up up to five inches. That leads to the potential for some flooding through at least today, even, even into the next couple of days as we continue to see that heavy rain working through as that system marches to the east. Switching gears, talking about the heat, because boy, we just cannot get a break in parts of Texas, extending into places like Oklahoma, New Mexico and, and parts of Louisiana under these heat alerts at this hour. We see uh, millions of people dealing with this heat once again. Triple digit temperatures expected for Austin today. 104 is where you're headed. The record for this date, 106. Del Rio going to blow past that record at 111 is the expected temperature this afternoon. Record so far, 106. So we'll likely break that. Wichita Falls will be close. San Angelo likely will break the record with a temperature of 112 degrees today. And we know after after days and days of this heat, that the potential for uh, heat exhaustion and all of that is going to be out there. So just making sure that you're taking it slow, taking frequent breaks, especially if you're doing strenuous activity outdoors. Tomorrow, more of the same. We don't get a real break from this heat, at least not a, a widespread area of us dealing with it until maybe Thursday or Friday. We're going to get back into those low 90s, still not great or comfortable temperatures by any means, especially if you don't have air conditioning. But we will see some, um, some minor improvements in that way. That does go for places like San Antonio. You're going to stay into the triple digits all the way through the beginning of the weekend, so it'll be uncomfortable. The heat will continue to be a, an issue here at least for the next few days. There's those alerts that I mentioned. Notice places like Dallas, Austin, Houston are all under that heat warning at this hour. Now, talking the traffic, boy, this is something that we might see in, in say, September. Instead, it's June, and we're dealing with Tropical Storm Brett. We've got winds up to 40 miles per hour, so just barely into that Tropical Storm category, but moving west at 17 miles per hour um, as it sits south of the Leeward Islands. Now, here's how it tracks over the next couple of days. We are expecting some intensification by the time we get into Thursday. Early morning hours, we could have a hurricane, Category 1, as it eyes uh, parts of the Caribbean. The Leeward Islands, the Windward Islands, basically the Lesser Antilles should monitor uh, impacts 
places like Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, all could see potential impacts. But there's still a lot of uncertainty, especially as we get down the line with this system. It's going to encounter some shear. Remember, that's that kind of those upper level winds that inhibit strengthening. So that'll be good if it starts to encounter some of that and we start to see some weakening. That is what the forecast calls for right now. But we'll be keeping a close eye on that. So we have Tropical Storm Brett. This is the third name system of the season so far in the Atlantic. But we also have a tropical disturbance that came off the coast of Africa. It does look like it could gain some steam, end up a little uh, healthier and become a tropical depression here in the coming days, guys. But like I said, man, this looks like, like September more than uh, it looks like June for the Atlantic hurricane season. No, we're not even in summer yet, right? We aren't, but those waters are really warm, record warm sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. So that's fuel for those storms. Wow. All right. Angie, thank you. All right, now to the White House and President Biden, who's in California for a second day. The president is there touting what his administration is doing to combat the climate crisis as part of his investing in America agenda. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins us now with more on this. So, Monica, good morning to you. We know President Biden spent the afternoon yesterday with Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, to talk about climate change and the projects he's had in the works. So what exactly is Biden pledging here and why the Bay? Area. What was the significance of that location? Well, really, it's what you guys have just been discussing on the program in these last two segments with weather and the fact that we are seeing this record breaking temperatures that has caused climate change really to result in some events that the White House, the administration has really worked to try to build climate resilience for. That's one of the main goals here. And the president specifically talking about funding that's coming from the Inflation Reduction Act that is aimed at this in places like California that has seen, of course, record wildfires and in the Bay Area specifically where they're trying to make some improvements to the electrical grid. So take a listen to how the president put the stakes and why he wanted to talk about this there specifically in California yesterday. The impacts we're seeing in climate change are only going to get more frequent and more ferocious and more costly. Last year alone, last year alone, natural disasters in America caused $165 billion in damage. We're taking the most aggressive climate action ever. It's focused on mitigation, which means historic investments in developing clean energy by reducing dependence on fossil fuel and resilience. So this is a combination of things that the president is likely going to be touting repeatedly. And some environmental groups actually just got together and endorsed the Biden-Harris 2024 campaign. So you can expect to see him talking about this on the trail, since, of course, he's running for re-election, but also in his official White House capacity, which is what he was doing there at that event specifically yesterday, Stephen. And Monica, I know it's still very early in California, but what are we expecting for day two here? The president is today going to be meeting with some experts in the field of AI, artificial intelligence, to talk about some of the risks that that can pose and also some of the ways that it can be used in a beneficial manner. So he's going to convene some of the leading minds on that. And this is an issue that the White House has been having several meetings on over the last couple of months. He asked many top CEOs in the field to come to the White House recently to tackle some of the thornier aspects to this new technology. And then later in the day, he's going going to have two fundraisers. So that's another big reason for heading out to the Bay Area, which is a beautiful place. I'm biased. That is where I grew up and I love it. There's much to do and see. But there's also really high dollar donors that the president can go to and ask for money for that reelect as it really gets off the ground this summer. Very beautiful. Certainly worse places to be. Monica, I did want to ask you about this. This week will mark one year since the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court. If you could briefly explain what the White House is doing to try to focus on reproductive rights now. There's going to be a high profile series of events that you're going to see starting today at the White House. The First Lady is going to convene a roundtable discussion with women who have been denied essential medical care in the years since that landmark reversal of Roe v. Wade since it was overturned in that Dobbs decision. So you're going to see her do that. And then later in the week on Friday, you're going to see the president and the vice president host an event with three of the largest groups on reproductive rights here in Washington. They're going to 
gather together and speak about what's at stake. Democrats really feel that in the years since then, and you saw this in the midterm elections, that the abortion access issue becomes really a galvanizing one for young voters, for women, for many people who care deeply about women having access to this kind of health care. And so even though they are talking about wanting to expand access and get rights back, they do believe that this message is resonating and they're continuing to talk about it. So that's why you're going to see everybody in the administration really focusing on that as the anniversary approaches on Saturday, Stephen and Ballard. A lot of dynamics at play. The Bay Area's own Monica Alba. Monica, thank you. Now the, to the latest on the critical talks between the United States and China with relations at a low point. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is touting progress following his meeting with the Chinese president. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has the latest. Good afternoon. A high stakes visit to Beijing capped by a handshake. Secretary of State Antony Blinken meeting China's President Xi Jinping for 35 minutes to stop what officials call a downward spiral in relations. Direct engagement and sustained communication at senior levels is the best way to responsibly manage our differences and ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. Xi's message to Blinken, I hope that through this visit, Mr. Secretary, you'll make more positive contributions to stabilizing China-U.S. relations. There's no shortage of flashpoints here. Tension over Taiwan, China's role in the fentanyl crisis, unanswered questions about the origins of COVID, Chinese officials not holding back on their grievances either, like U.S. export bans on technology. In an interview with NBC News, Blinken said the two-day visit has stabilized ties, at least for now. Both China and the United States, I think, recognize that uh, we were in an increasingly unstable place in our relationship. I think this is um, the start of a process to put a little more stability into it. But China refused Blinken's request to reopen military crisis lines that were cut off by Beijing nearly a year ago. Since then, some close calls, including this Chinese warship sailing within 150 yards of a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait, and this Chinese fighter jet darting in front of an American surveillance plane, something we saw for ourselves when we were on board another U.S. Navy plane intercepted by a Chinese jet. We've seen a couple of very dangerous incidents in the last couple of weeks. China says the encounters are justified to protect its sovereignty. Blinken's first trip here was called off after that Chinese spy balloon, which was shot down after it flew over the U.S. Senior U.S. officials told NBC News it collected intelligence from American military sites. I think it was more embarrassing than it was tension. So with Beijing, the balloon incident is over. It's water well, under the bridge. We did what we needed to do to protect our interests. We said what we needed to say and made clear what we needed to make clear in terms of this not happening again. And so uh, as long as it doesn't, that, uh, that chapter should be closed. Relations are at such a low point. Just having the meeting is seen by both sides as a positive. Now other high-level visits are expected to follow, with President Xi potentially meeting President Biden in the U.S. before the end of the year. Welcome back. Now to the ongoing war in Ukraine as the country continues to ramp up its counteroffensive efforts against Russia. Yeah, fighting in recent weeks has led to small but hopeful gains for Ukrainians as training to take on Russian forces intensifies. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Kharkiv, Ukraine. And we want to warn you, some of the footage that you're about to see in his report may be disturbing to some viewers. Valerie Stephen, good morning. Yeah, that's right. This footage is really intense. It was released by Ukrainian special forces. It shows them storming a trench during an operation in the south. And it gives you a sense of the kind of up-close, grinding combat that's involved in this counteroffensive. Ukrainian forces releasing this footage of close quarters combat. Commandos in intense gun battles, trench by trench, shooting Russian soldiers. The video blurred because of its graphic nature. Two weeks in, Ukraine's counteroffensive is gaining ground, but slowly and at a cost. This assault with tanks and self-destructing drones leading to the liberation of a hamlet in Zaporizhia. Ukraine's flag raised for the first time since it fell under Russian occupation more than a year ago. 
But right now, progress is being measured in small villages, not cities. Russian forces are dug in and bringing their superior air power to the fight. Ukrainian troops also advancing through fields of Russian landmines like this. But Ukraine has a new tool in its arsenal. And it comes from the U.S. These troops are simulating loading up onto an American-made MRAP. This is a mine-resistant vehicle supplied by the United States, and it's designed to protect Ukrainian troops as they pass through waves of Russian minefields. Each vehicle weighs 14 tons, and the U.S. has given Ukraine more than 500 of them since the start of the war. And though this driver hasn't had American training, he used Google to fill in the blanks. We searched for about five days to find the air conditioning, he says. These troops are from the Hurricane Brigade of Ukraine's National Guard. They're a mixture of combat veterans and new recruits, and they're practicing the kind of trench warfare they'll face when they join the counteroffensive. Are these men ready to fight for real in the East? Yes, they're ready to some extent, he says. They've gone through almost four weeks of training and still have a little more to go. This officer, codenamed Genie, is one of the unit's veterans. Before the war, you were helping people learn English, and now you're fighting full time. Yeah. Did you ever imagine this would be your life? Um, no, I, I never dreamed of it, you know, in this way. Uh, but uh, in 2014, it was obvious. I, I cannot stand, stay away from this. Do you feel that there will ever be peace here? Yes, of course, when we're going to kill all Russians. When you win? <laughs> yes. How long do you think that will take? Uh, it doesn't matter how long it will take. We need to stop them. Ordinary people taking up arms and determined to fight for as long as it takes. And guys, most of those volunteers we met training on that American equipment were from the Kyiv region. The Ukrainian capital was targeted again overnight by Russian drones. This was the first strike in about two weeks. And it comes after an absolutely relentless May when there were strikes every 48 hours or so. Fortunately, no injuries reported in Kyiv. Guys. All right. We appreciate your reporting, Raf. Thank you so much. Now to more international headlines, starting in Israel, where a raid in the occupied West Bank led to a violent firefight. NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now with the latest on that. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Five Palestinians are dead, including two teenagers and dozens more injured after that Israeli raid in Jenin in the occupied West Bank. The Israeli military saying that eight of its troops were also injured and evacuated. Now, Israel conducts these raids in the West Bank from time to time, but this one really was unusual. The military firing from Apache attack helicopters for the first time in nearly 20 years. Now to Germany, where that American woman injured in that attack near an iconic castle, she has now been released from the hospital. The 22-year-old was allegedly pushed into a canyon by a 30-year-old man from Michigan who was assaulting her and her friend after luring them onto a trail near the castle. Now that 21-year-old friend of the woman was killed in the attack, the suspect now being held on suspicion of murder. And finally, to Nepal, where new research confirms that climate change is melting ice and snow faster than we even knew. A report from the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development has found that glaciers in the world's highest mountains melted 65 percent faster between 2010 and 2019 than they did in the decade before. Now, that is fueling concern not only about more floods, landslides, things like that, but also about the water supply for people in more than a dozen countries who rely on water from those rivers coming off those mountains. Guys? Mm, some concerning stuff. All right, Josh, thank you. Today is World Refugee Day. It celebrates the strength and courage of people who have been forced to leave their country to escape conflict or persecution. The day was created by the United Nations to honor refugees around the world. Yeah, and it comes in such a crucial time. According to the UN, the total number of people worldwide who have been displaced has hit a new high. The UN is saying approximately 110 million people are currently displaced by war, persecution, violence, and human rights abuses. And of that total, 35 million are refugees or people who crossed an international border to find safety. 
Verena Knaus, Global Chief of Migration and Displacement at UNICEF, joins us now. Verena, good morning. Those statistics are just staggering. Which global conflicts are creating the biggest refugee crisis right now? They are indeed staggering, and especially when we remember that four in ten of those refugees are children, eight-year-olds, five-year-olds, 12-year-olds who were driven from their homes. So this record number that we're seeing here that we need to remember today on World Refugee Day is really driven by conflicts and violence in places like Syria, in places like uh, violence or Venezuela, in places like Ukraine that have really been driving and accelerating the numbers of children displaced. But it's also driven by climate impacts, the climate crisis that is unfolding in the form of storms and floods. And as UNICEF, we looked at figures and we saw that every single day, 20,000 children have been displaced by storms, floods, fires, droughts in the last six years. So we are going to see these numbers grow and these children need our help and support. Marina, so many people affected it, and you were focusing on children there. I really want to hit on some of those numbers you were mentioning. According to UNICEF, at the end of last year, there were 43 million children living in forced displacement. So what work is UNICEF doing for these kids? I know it's so important for children, no matter their circumstances, to be able to just be children. Yeah, you are right. Um, we need to always first see them as children because no one plans to become a refugee. As we saw that in the conflict in Ukraine, the day before children were going to school, the day after they are now hiding in bomb shelters in the metro stations in Kiev. Um, as UNICEF, we are everywhere in the world and trying to, in a way, bring back a sense of childhood to those children, make sure that they can continue to learn, that they can continue to go to schools, that the classroom and the education follows them. We're also trying to make sure and to support governments and work with partners to make sure that these children can actually seek protection, which means being allowed to apply for asylum, that they can continue to get vaccinated, that they don't need to suffer ill health because they have been driven from their homes. Um, but also, I think it's important to start seeing those children as partners. Um, they are very often incredibly creative. They are resilient. They are a source of talent. So involving them in our own work has really enriched and has strengthened our own ability to be, to be the best partner for them everywhere in the world, from Afghanistan to Honduras to the countries around Syria. Such a, a global issue. Verena Knaus, we really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Illinois is taking action to protect the privacy of women who may be driving somewhere to get an abortion. It's through new legislation that will prevent the tracking of license plates. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson has more on this. If it feels like you are being tracked, it may be because you are at red lights, going in and out of the office, on your smartphone. But what if you could be tracked seeking a legal abortion simply by your license plate? I don't think people realize how much of their personal data is collected, that their whereabouts are tracked. That's why Illinois Secretary of State Alexei Janoulias backs what he says is a first in the nation bill to outlaw sharing or selling license plate data for women seeking abortions. Who has access to license plate trackers? A number of private and public entities have this personal sensitive data. Data he fears could be weaponized as some states try to criminalize helping someone get an abortion, even in a state where it is legal. Three other states have passed laws aimed at protecting health data from such efforts. When they travel, whether it's to an abortion clinic or the grocery store, we need to make sure this data is protected. Illinois Right to Life Executive Director Mary Kate Zander opposes abortion. So do you think this bill is necessary? I think it's unnecessary. They're trying to create a narrative around um, what the pro-life movement may or may not be doing. In this she says her organization is not trying to criminalize women seeking the procedure. Is the right to life movement tracking license plates of women? No, no, absolutely, absolutely not. Has it done that in the past? No. Do you see it not. doing that in the future? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's just not a tactic that we would use. With a quarter of their patients now from out of state, Illinois Planned Parenthood CEO Jennifer Welch is not convinced. Patients need to know that when they come for health care, that information won't be shared with anybody, law enforcement, activists, anybody else.
data collection and privacy, a new frontier in the nation's fight over abortion rights. Ann Thompson, NBC News, Chicago. It's time now for our weekly mental health check-in, and we're taking a closer look at generational trauma. We have some tips on how to address some of the sensitive topics that may be weighing heavy on your family. Also this morning, we're taking a look at are you struggling with late night cravings? We have more on how to spot potential food addictions. So let's bring in a licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. George James, once again, for more on all of these headlines. Dr. James, thanks so much for being with us this morning. And let's start with that generational trauma. It's a phrase we're seeing more and more. I see it all over TikTok lately, even people in movies talking about it, like everything, everywhere, all at once. So if you would walk us through what does generational trauma really mean and is there anything we can do to try to combat it? Yeah, uh, yes, Stephen, actually generational trauma is something that some communities have been sharing for a long time. Uh, Survivor of folks who uh, have uh, family members who were enslaved, folks from the Holocaust, have been sharing that th this experience of what their uh, previous generations have gone through, they feel the impact. And what that means is that sometimes it's the worldview that people continue to see in generations after, or even the way of the anxiety that they might feel. And some of it is being able to hopefully hold on to the resilience of some of the people that have been before us, or even now to pass on uh, resilience going forward. So it is something that we can talk about and something that we can start to work against so that it doesn't impact future generations. Switching gears now to food addiction, a recent poll from Michigan Medicine shows one in eight Americans over the age of 50 struggle with food addiction, though it's not just limited to older adults. The condition is not recognized as a real addiction by medical organizations, but there is research to suggest people are still struggling. Doctor, why do people become addicted to food and how can we create healthier relationships with the foods that we eat? You know, there's lots of people who will say that they will do things or eat things that they probably shouldn't, and they do that at high levels, especially around processed foods. And some of it is also the, the believed comfort that they might receive, the, the ways that they might feel changes in their body, but also the letdown. This is part of the reason why thoughts around addiction comes up. Some of it is really changing how we think about food personally, but also about what are the access to food. Some communities are forced that these are their only options. So we need to look at it as a community level as well as a personal and hopefully change some of these things so that people can have healthy relationships with food. And just talking about it can be so important to help overcome some shame that people have associated with this. And doctor, I wanted to ask you about this one before we let you go. Something for our Taylor Swift fans out there. Many people have been flocking to social media. They're talking about their experiences following the Airs tour. So many people saying that they can't really remember chunks of the concert. Some also saying they feel intensely sad in the days after the show. So what's going on here? What's up with this uh, so-called post-concert depression? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, you both, but you know, what happens when you get really excited about something, you put it on your calendar, it is the biggest event, and then it happens, there is a letdown. And so it's not necessarily depression, but sometimes it could be the, the blues, it could be the after effect. And some of those things it also include a little bit of amnesia because you're so heightened of being in the moment that your brain isn't even focusing on trying to remember what actually happened. That's why we're glad that we're taking those selfies or we're taking those pictures that we can relive the moment and say, yes, I was at that Taylor Swift concert and maybe I'll play some songs to make me feel better because now I don't have it to look forward to. Wow, interesting stuff. Yeah, adrenaline surging. I guess that, that makes sense. I'm not going to bash anybody for taking those videos at concerts anymore because right? now it makes <laughs> a little more sense. All right, Dr. George James, thanks so much. More now on news that could impact your pockets. If you're in the market to buy a house, it might not be an easy process. Yeah, sky-high prices and low inventory have prospective buyers being priced out. CNBC's senior real estate correspondent Diana Olick has everything you need to know on what's now being called the, quote, build to rent property boom. Single mom Robin Ashford had planned to buy a home near Columbia, South Carolina last year, but mortgage rates suddenly shot sharply higher. I found out that I wasn't going to have as much buying power as I would have about two or three years ago. Um, and my mortgage, my monthly mortgage payments were too much that I could handle. So instead, Ashford turned to this brand new community built specifically for renters. I don't have to worry about taxes on the home. I don't have to worry about if something breaks, um, you know. The, it's 
the landlord's responsibility. They have large open floor plans. They and an increasing share of the landlords are now big builders, like Bruce McNeilage's Nashville-based Kinlock Partners, as more Americans decide to rent not only by necessity, but by choice. We've had a societal shift to people wanting to rent because they want a maintenance-free lifestyle or they want uh, the ability to move to a city and just give the keys back to the landlord at the end of the lease. Builders put up 68,000 new single-family rental homes last year, a 31 percent increase over the year before, according to John Burns' research. I think it's at the early stages of being a very, very big business, just like the apartment market is. Burns counted 708 build-to-rent communities coming soon across the U.S., entire communities of single-family homes built not for sale, but specifically for rent. The people that want a home but have now been priced out due to rising prices and then rising mortgage rates are saying, well, I want a home, I'm going to rent for a while. So it's created more demand for the rental homes. And renters are demanding more of the builders. Amenities like pools, fitness centers, dog parks, of course, on-site maintenance, and as in this community, bigger backyards. But all that comes at a price. The average rent here is about $2,200 a month, and single-family rents across the nation are rising. That's something that I do need to think about because trying to save for a home while paying high rent, it's, it's hard. For now, she's enjoying the new home, even if it's not her new home. For NBC News, Diana Olick, Blythewood, South Carolina. This Pride Month, we are shining a light on people who are working to make a difference for the community. Olympic silver medalist Erica Sullivan is not only a rising junior in college, she's also a proud, openly LGBTQ plus athlete. Yeah, and she's using her voice to amplify the triumphs of the queer community. We're very happy to have Erica with us this morning. Hi there, Erica. Hey, we, know how you're, you doing? we know you're starting your junior year of college at the University of Texas in a few months. You're an Olympic medalist. You've already accomplished so much in the face of adversity, everything from losing your father to overcoming mental health issues and navigating your sexual identity as a public figure. Why is it so important for you to be open about these very personal topics? Yeah, um, I feel like I have to be open about this because specifically in the world of swimming, I didn't have anyone to look up to. Um, I feel like in other sports, there's some sort of representation, but swimming is kind of a few steps behind. So, um, you know, I had a moment where I realized that I wanted to be a role model that I didn't have. Mm, so important, uh, representation so vital. Erica, I know you're the spokesperson for Speedo's Pride Collection, so congratulations about that. And you also chose the Human Rights Campaign to receive $40,000 donation from the company for Pride Month. So tell us about that partnership. Why is this so important to you? Yeah, um, I've been working together with Speedo for two years now. Um, I'll be wearing them for every single meet until I retire. And um, having them listen to my opinions on what charity I think it should go to was um, honestly something I had never experienced before. It was, it was really awesome. And being able to work with Human Rights Campaign again, because um, I went to their dinner a few months ago, was really a cool moment. And um, just honestly being able to do good in the world and um, try to impact uh, life for gay kids, trans kids, queer kids in any way possible is just really important to me. Yeah, becoming that representation that you talked about. You're an outspoken member of the LGBTQ plus community. You founded an LGBTQ plus student athlete organization at your college. What are some of the other ways you're using your platform to champion for those rights? Yeah, I feel like it's just um, being good representation. Um, I feel like it's very easy to um, see a lot of bad representation in the world, um, especially among athletes. Um, and I think it's just kind of prioritizing being the good in the world. So um, ch working with a lot of charities, um, you know, being that LGBTQ org at University of Texas and um, honestly being there for people and knowing that they have a name that they can look at and seeing a name that's doing, you know, as much good as possible. So I try to do as much charity stuff as I can. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing so much right now, Erica. And I want to ask, what's next for you? Uh, we looking at possible the Olympics uh, in Paris next summer? Oh, yeah, training for that now. Um, we actually just hit the 365 days until Olympic trials a couple days ago. So wow. Paris is quickly looming around the corner, whether people recognize it or not. 
Um, so just training for that and then going to school. Wow, you are incredibly busy. All the stuff you've listed to us this morning and just growing up as a gay kid, Erica, it's so important. Our eyes are always looking around for, for representation. So thanks so much for what you're doing. We really appreciate you being with us this morning, Erica Sullivan. Welcome back. Of course, dogs are humans' best friends, but for one diver, it's actually a fish. <laughs> back in 2021, Wisconsin diver Reg Skalubra noticed a smallmouth bass following him pretty closely in the water. So he decided to name that fish Elvis. And Rex now visits Elvis each and every year in that same lake. The diver says all he has to do is shout out a call that he taught Elvis and then look for a distinct scar that he has on his face. And the two are actually so closely bonded, Elvis even attempts to fight other fish who try to get near Rex. So Elvis is a little bit jealous, Valerie, but it's a friendship. It's something that could be a children's book. I love this story. I wonder how he decided to name him Elvis. Ooh, good question. I don't know that we'll that would be my go-to name for a fish. But <laughs> it's a good question, yeah. I like it. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Influencing is a multi-billion dollar business and a dream job for many. A recent morning consult survey found it's a job that over half of young Americans would jump at having. But for some people, the opposite is true. There are a growing number of creators who have not just burned out, but have decided to retire completely from influencing. NBC News digital reporter Maya Eaglin reports on that trend. I was 20 years old in 2009 when I started my channel. For 11 years, Ingrid Nilsson's day-to-day -day revolved around documenting her life and broadcasting it to her more than 3 million followers. Hey guys, this is my favorite hairstyle to wear. Today, I'm going to be doing the TMI tag. I'm going to be showing you every single thing that I eat today. But putting everything online had negative effects offline. As I kept vlogging more, I realized that sharing the mundane parts of my life were actually the things that I needed to keep for myself. I just feel like I need to have a little breather and get myself together a little bit. It made me, as I got older, want to pull away because I wanted to figure out who I was and I was trying to figure out how to do that on the internet. Ultimately, the big moment came in 2020 when we were all in lockdown. I thought to myself, I can stop. I can stop doing this now. This video that you're watching right now is going to be the last video that I post on my YouTube channel. Ingrid's not alone. A small but steady stream of creators have moved on from the influencing life, whether it's because they've outgrown it or are simply focusing on other business ventures. I am going to be taking off some extended time from Instagram. Do I put influencer on the top of my resume? I just didn't know how to do it, but so I just kind of did it and figured it out. Lee Tillman's a former Instagram influencer who now works as a creative strategist. I soon felt like a billboard, which in a way, that's how I made my money. But I started to feel like it wasn't about me anymore. I was like, you know, uh, brands want to use access my audience. And that's when I kind of started to think, what would it be like if I were just normal? She also offers a workshop on how to lead the influencing life. I just thought, I don't know if anyone's going to sign up. If, even if I just get one sign up, it's a success. It sold out. These days, Ingrid lives a quieter life, running a candle business. Working with something that is tactile is absolutely therapeutic coming off of the internet. My co-founder Erica and I launched the new Savant in December 2020 with 500 candles and we sold out in seven minutes. And what I've realized is now people actually care more about the product than they care about what's going on in my life, which is exactly how I want it to be. What a nice break after all of that. I think she oh, said yeah. she was posting everything she ate in one day. I mean, that's that's got to be a lot. Yeah, that's grueling. I'm glad she's getting a break there. All right, our thanks to Maya for that story. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Valerie Castro. And I'm Stephen Romo. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, it's a race against time off the East Coast this morning. The Coast Guard is combing the Atlantic for a missing submersible. It vanished over the weekend while on a mission to explore the wreckage of the Titanic. We've got the latest on that search this morning, plus what we're learning about the people on board. 
not letting up. This morning, hundreds of thousands of people from Texas to Tennessee are once again waking up without power after another devastating day of extreme weather. And that includes several tornadoes along with record-breaking heat. Today, millions across the South are under the threat of more severe weather. We've got the latest track on those storms in just a moment, plus the harrowing stories of survival on the ground. Also this morning, out and proud. As Pride Month rolls on, we'll take a closer look at the LGBTQ plus athletes who may have once struggled with coming out to their teammates, but who are now being embraced for who they are. Plus surrogacy as a path to parenthood for LGBTQ couples and the hurdles some still face as they try to build a family. And we'll end this hour with what's being called a women's winter. Summer temperatures soaring outside, but inside, the office temps, they are plunging. And the battle over that precious thermostat, that is heating up. I have a lot of strong opinions about that one. I definitely have the extra sweaters and sweatshirts at my desk. Got to have them. That makes sense. All right. We do begin, though, this morning with that urgent search that's underway 900 miles off the coast of Cape Cod. Crews are searching for a missing tourist submersible that was lost at the iconic Titanic wreckage site on Sunday. Five people are on board the Ocean Gate research vessel Titan, but nothing has been heard from the vessel since they lost contact with it less than two hours into their dive. NBC's Tom Costello has the latest on the search now from Boston. Good day. Yeah, U.S. Coast Guard Boston is in command of the search and rescue operation in close collaboration with Canadian Coast Guard. They have had a ship on site all night searching for any signs of the submersible. Yesterday and today, they've had planes in the air. The challenge here is that they had four days worth of air when they went into the water early Sunday morning. It's now been two days, and of course, right now, the clock is ticking. In the cold North Atlantic, an all-hands-on-deck search and rescue operation looking for any signs of a small private submersible and the five people on board missing since Sunday after going to explore the Titanic wreckage. It is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets. It's a 21-foot submersible named Titan, made of titanium and carbon fiber, owned by OceanGate, a private private company that charters tours costing as much as $250,000. Among the paying passengers, billionaire Hamish Harding, whose previous adventures included a submersible dive to the Mariana Trench and a space flight on Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin. On Instagram Sunday, he signed his name on the logo as he announced he'd be diving to the Titanic. Also on board, Pakistani British businessman Shahzada Dawood, along with his son Suleiman, according to his company. Overnight, OceanGate released a new statement. Our entire focus is on the well-being of the crew and every step possible is being taken to bring the five crew members back safely. Last year, the company's founder and CEO discussed the ongoing fascination with the Titanic on Seattle's King 5 TV. We have yeah. a number of people who come with us, we sometimes refer to as Titaniacs, um, people <laughs> who have just been consumed by the, by the Titanic, and it was just great to take them down. Among the search efforts, U.S. and Canadian C-1 30s conducting visual and radar aerial searches and dropping sonar buoys in the water listening for the sub. When something happens on the high seas, it gets complicated uh, quickly because of winds, oceans, drift, all that stuff. Considered the world's most famous shipwreck, the Titanic rests at a treacherous depth of two and a half miles. 1,500 people died when the ship sank in 1912. In recent years, other tourist submersibles have tried exploring the wreckage. Now search teams are in a race against the clock for this missing sub oxygen potentially running low so a canadian p8 dropped that sonar buoy we discussed and i asked the admiral what specifically are they listening for he said we're listening for any voices any tapping we might be able to hear any signs of somebody who's alive in the water and inside that submersible but here's the challenge 13,000 feet is the depth of the Titanic. A typical U.S. Navy submarine, the best of the best, only goes to two to 3,000 feet down. So this is an incredibly challenging and risky operation, and no human can dive that deep. Back to you. All right, we'll be keeping posted on those updates. Tom, thank you so much. We'll have more on the search coming up later this hour.
All right, now to more on that severe weather that parts of the country have been grappling with over the past few weeks. Many communities still in recovery after storms and deadly tornadoes swept through, causing some major damage along the way. And today, more record-breaking heat is on the horizon for parts of the southeast this morning. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us from Lewin, Mississippi, where a tornado touched down just yesterday. Blaine, good morning to you. How are things looking? Well, Stephen, good morning to you. Yeah, this is just one terrifying picture of the storm's fury right here. This tractor trailer has come to rest right here. But a gentleman who lives nearby tells us it was clear down the street. It was picked up, tossed here by the storm, and came to a rest. All up and down this street, areas nearby, you see much of the same picture, Stephen. Houses that are largely unrecognizable. And for so many people across the southeast, the threat continues today. This morning, as millions across the southeast face record-breaking heat, heavy rain, and no power, yet another round of severe weather and tornadoes are taking their toll. The latest strike in Moss Point, Mississippi, downing trees and power lines in the small Gulf town, ripping roofs off homes and stripping the steeple from this church. I'm still shook up, man, because I'm thankful to be alive. It's one of at least 18 reported tornadoes across the region in the last week, claiming at least six lives, including one in Lewin, Mississippi. Felt like a giant was hitting the house with a sledgehammer. Derry Pierce felt the storm's brutal strength, an EF3 tornado striking in the dead of night, injuring nearly two dozen and taking the life of 67-year-old Georgine Hayes. Her house, where the black Jeep at? Right there. It, it was right there. It, 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 it's gone now. Ain't nothing there. In nearby Canton, Mississippi, more heartbreak after 67-year-old Wilbert Maine Fleming was killed by a falling tree. It, this hurt right now. Down in Florida, the storms also took a toll, with one confirmed tornado in the panhandle. Heavy rain also caused flash floods in southern Alabama, turning streets into raging rivers. This as 35 million residents in the region swelter under blistering heat. It's like 94 inside. And that heat is making the cleanup in places like this all the more difficult, guys, when you consider the fact that you have so many people without power and also dealing with no air conditioning as they're out here in these high temperatures. In fact, the best of the height of the heat, rather, is expected to continue well into tomorrow. Some parts of Texas will see heat indexes up to 122 degrees. Stephen. Folks dealing with so much out there. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you. Now to some more severe weather on the way. We're keeping an eye on some heavy rain that's expected to hit the southeast. Meanwhile, the Caribbean is also bracing for a possible hurricane. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us to break it all down for us. A lot going on, Angie. There sure is a lot going on. That might be even an understatement at this point, but let's start the farthest away with what's going on in the tropics. In the Atlantic, uh, this system fairly rare for this time of year. This is something we usually see later into the season when the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic have really warmed up, but uh, unfortunately they're just as warm as they normally are in later parts of the season. So this is what we get. Tropical storm, Brett. 40 mile per hour winds right now just barely into that tropical storm category. But still moving west at 17 miles per hour. We're going to see this continue its westward movement in the coming days, likely becoming a Category 1 hurricane in the short term. We're talking by early morning Thursday, Category 1 hurricane strength, about 75 miles per hour. Notice, though, that doesn't stay. It doesn't stick with us. We'll start to see it inhibit some, uh, some or encounter, rather, some, some things that kind of inhibit its strengthening and actually cause it to weaken, looking at a tropical storm as we get into parts of the later half of the work week and into the weekend as that system eyes parts of the Caribbean and moves into the Caribbean Sea. Either way, we'll look for some added rainfall and potentially some strong winds in some parts of uh, the Lesser Antilles, the Windward Islands, maybe the Leeward Islands, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands included in that. But we will keep a close eye on it in the coming days as that forecast kind of comes into better, into more of a more certainty. Here's what else we're watching, a tropical disturbance that came off the coast of Africa. We have those really warm temperatures. So this could likely become um, a, a tropical depression here as we get into the next couple of days. Again, those sea surface temperatures are fuel for those storms, so we'll watch that. Meanwhile, severe threat, 5 million people, including parts of uh, Louisiana, New Orleans included in this, Alexandria, Lake Charles, as well as the heavy rain threat that will lead to some flash flooding concerns across much of the southeast. We could see some spots dealing with upwards of 5 inches. Today, watch for the Charlotte area. You could see some flash flooding. That risk will come with just uh, maybe 3 inches of localized amounts possible in a short period of time. And of course, we can't not talk about the heat in Texas and stretching into Louisiana 
Louisiana, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Those alerts are up. And for good reason, guys, triple digits today, tomorrow, a lot of places, most places in that same area, they're not going to cool down past those mid-90s for the extended period. So it'll be a couple of days where they're still going to need to crank the AC and find I know a cool people spot. are still cleaning up from some of the storm damage, yeah. so those triple digits mm. got to be brutal. They are. Right. Thanks, Jim. We're learning more details this morning about that meeting between Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the Chinese president. The talks came as part of an effort to ease tensions between the U.S. and China, but issues still remain after the meeting. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Maggie Freyer joins us now from Beijing with the latest. Janice, good morning. Valerie, good morning. Secretary of State Antony Blinken came to Beijing with very low expectations, uh, but he told me that it would be totally irresponsible for the U.S. to not engage with China. So the aim was to at least stabilize relations to avoid conflict. Good afternoon. A high-stakes visit to stabilize relations between the U.S. and China. Secretary of State Antony Blinken meeting with China's President Xi Jinping after two intense days here. After that meeting, Secretary Blinken sat down with us and was clear this visit had to happen. We were in an increasingly unstable place in our relationship. I think this is um, the start of a process to put a little more stability into it. With friction on nearly every front, including tariffs, espionage and Taiwan, U.S.-China relations have been in near freefall. Add to it now growing tension over a Chinese spy base on Cuba. I repeatedly raised it. And, of course, this is not something new. Is the administration at all concerned that about China making it more than a spy base? We always have concerns when they are physically taking a position that could turn into a military base of some kind. Chinese officials have grievances, too, like U.S. export bans on technology and U.S. sanctions on several senior officials here, including Xi's Minister of Defense. It's why China refused Blinken's request to reopen military crisis lines, communication cut off by Beijing last year, despite dangerously close encounters between warships in the Taiwan Strait and military aircraft over the South China Sea. Something we saw in February on board another U.S. Navy plane intercepted by a Chinese jet. That's the quickest path to an inadvertent conflict. I can say that they understand very clearly the importance we attach to this. I think it's profoundly in their interest, too. This was the trip Secretary Blinken called off when that spy balloon was shot down. So I asked him, does this mean the balloon incident is now water under the bridge with China? And he told me, so long as it doesn't happen again, quote, that chapter should be closed. So there is the sense this visit is going to pave the way for a potential meeting between President Biden and President Xi in the U.S. before the end of the year. Valerie? Janice, thanks so much. Well, it's been one week now since former President Donald Trump pleaded not guilty to federal charges in connection with his handling of classified documents. Well, now we're hearing a new defense from Trump about those documents as his rivals, well, they are ramping up calls for new leadership. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now with the latest on this. Some interesting justifications here, Kristen. Absolutely. Hi, Stephen. Good morning to you. A federal judge has barred former President Trump from disclosing or keeping any evidence set to be turned over by the government in this case. But in a new interview, Mr. Trump is giving some of his most extensive comments yet about the charges against him. In his first interview since pleading not guilty to 37 criminal charges tied to his handling of classified material, former President Trump delivered a new defense when asked why he didn't return classified documents subpoenaed by the Justice Department. Because I had boxes. I want to go through the boxes and get all my personal things out. I don't want to hand that over to Nara yet. And I was very busy, as you've sort of seen. Yeah, but I've according very, to the indictment, busy. you then tell this aide to move to other locations after telling your lawyers to say you'd fully complied with the subpoena when you hadn't. But before I send boxes over, I have to take all of my things out. These boxes were interspersed with all sorts of things. According to the indictment, Mr. Trump is accused of mishandling more than 100 classified documents and also showing classified material to other people who did not have clearance in 2021, including a military 
military plan that he said remained secret. The indictment quotes an audio recording of Mr. Trump saying, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't. The former president pressed about that recording. When I said that I couldn't declassify it now, that's because I wasn't president. I, I never made any bones about that. When I'm not president, I can't declassify and that. That's what you said. You didn't I said declassify that. it. I, I said, no, no. I said I couldn't I de could have but that declassified it. That wasn't a document. It. Brett, there was no document. That was a massive amount of papers and everything else talking about Iran and other things. So far, the charges against Mr. Trump have not dented his double-digit lead in the Republican presidential race. President Biden, who's also under investigation by a special counsel for his handling of classified material, which he turned over to authorities, hasn't commented about Mr. Trump's latest legal challenges. Instead, this week, stepping up his campaign rollout in California with four fundraisers on tap today. Now, as for Mr. Trump, his former attorney general turned critic Bill Barr is out with a new op-ed in the Free Press this morning. Barr writing, Trump's indictment is not the result of unfair government persecution. This is a situation entirely of his own making. Barr also calling Trump's behavior indefensible. Still, the former president continues to be the clear frontrunner for the Republican nomination, Stephen. All right. Kristen, thanks so much for that update. We're back with breaking news out of Romania, where disgraced influencer Andrew Tate has been indicted and will face charges of rape, human trafficking, and forming a criminal, criminal gang to sexually exploit women. According to Romanian officials, three others will also be charged in connection to human trafficking, including Andrew's brother, Tristan. A spokesperson for the Tate brothers confirmed their indictment to NBC News. Both brothers deny all allegations. The two were remanded into custody back in December before being released under house arrest in March. They are currently waiting for a trial date to be set. All right, and now to Washington, where Republican lawmakers in the House are taking steps to try to block public access to military service records. Their push for a new bill to keep that information private comes after the Pentagon mistakenly released the personal information of several Republican politicians who were current or former members of the armed forces. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby joins us now for more on this. So, Courtney, news organizations and even sometimes employers use that information to try to verify someone's military service. So if you can, tell us what information is available right now and what is this bill hoping to restrict? That's right. And Stephen, to, to people like you and I, this could have a chilling effect on our ability to verify an individual's military service. So the information that we get in, these, in this releasable service information is very basic. Someone's name, rank, dates of service, so how long they serve. Sometimes it will include things like decorations and awards and maybe some information about a deployment. But it is very basic. In fact, it's so basic that when the Pentagon laid out its rules for privacy for members of the military, it said that these, th these specific things that they could put out did not have any imp impact on an individual's privacy. So this is information that I got to tell you, today already I have requested someone's service information. It is a very standard practice that we in the news media do. Now, you mentioned that case of about 11 people whose information was improperly released by the Air Force several months ago. These are two totally separate cases. In that case, that was someone who claimed to be an employer who came and, and filled out what's called an SF-180, a standard form 180. If, 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 in fact, someone puts in a request for that information, which generally includes more personal details than the basic releasable information, then the individual has to consent to their information being released. That service member, current or former, has to consent. Well, that's where the mistake happened in the case of, of Congressman Don Bacon and others. They never got consented to their information being released. The Air Force admitted that it was a complete mistake that they took and they have taken full ownership and they're still looking into how that happened. But the information that we as the news media get, it's very basic. And this will have a chilling effect on our ability to verify whether somebody served at all in the military going forward if this passes, Stephen. Hmm. It'll be fascinating to see how that plays out. And Courtney, what are the consequences, though, if this bill does not pass? So if it doesn't, everything will probably be about status quo. But the concern here is this is part of the House Appropriations Committee markup on defense. 
It's about 150 pages long. This is at the very end. Defense officials who I spoke with about this are concerned about a number of different provisions. And the ones I spoke with said, look, there are so many specific cases and specific um, information here that we're going to fight that they don't want to, that they do not want to happen, um, eliminating entire offices out of the Pentagon, for instance, that this may be one of those cases that while the Pentagon does not want this provision to become law, it may not be one that they fight hard. That's what defense officials here are concerned about. And again, it will really impact the public's uh, information about service members. You know, th there's an issue called stolen valor. It's something that became so prominent, such a problem, that about a decade ago, Congress passed the Stolen Valor Act. And what it means is there are individuals who come forward and say they have military service, they've, create, they've gotten these awards, they've earned these specific things like a Purple Heart or a Bronze Star, and they're trying to claim benefits or money because of what they claim to be their military service. Without this basic information available to people like us, to even um, employers in some cases, it will be very difficult to suss out those cases of stolen valor. And we could see an increase of them going forward, Stephen. Hmm. A lot of military members certainly concerned about stolen valor. All right, Courtney, thanks so much. All right, turning now to more international headlines, Israel's parliament taking steps to limit the Supreme Court's influence over government power. NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now with more. Good morning, Josh. Hey guys, good morning. That is right. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel had put that controversial judicial overhaul on hold months ago after unprecedented political protests throughout Israel. But now that overhaul is back. Israel's finance minister saying work in parliament may pick up as early as Wednesday. That's after compromise talks between Netanyahu's coalition and the opposition failed to really make any progress. Critics say that the overhaul could mean an end to democracy in Israel. Now to Europe, where a new report reveals just how much damage climate change is doing to the continent. The analysis by the World Meteorological Organization and the EU estimates 16,000 people died related to global warming last summer, which was the hottest summer on record for the continent of Europe. The report also says that extreme heat, wildfires, glacier melt, and drought are all getting worse, with Europe warming faster than any other continent. And finally, right back here to England, where scientists have discovered fossilized remains of a new species of dinosaur on the Isle of Wight in the English Channel. The dinosaur was a plant eater and was found at a site dating back to about 145 million to 66 million years ago. They're calling it Vectipelta beretti. It's named after a fossil expert and Professor Paul Barrett from London's Natural History Museum. Pretty cool stuff. That's got to be a wow. career highlight, having a dinosaur yeah. named after you. <laughs> Hard to beat that. Josh, <laughs> thank you. Welcome back. This Pride Month, we're taking a look at the role LGBTQ plus athletes play in the sports world. And that's as more and more athletes are coming out publicly early in their careers, especially at the collegiate level. Our Joe Fire spoke with three of those athletes who all dream of heading to the pros. Four prints and she gets it to go. They're scoring points, making saves, tackling the competition, and blazing trades. In a word, how does it feel to be an out college athlete? I would say bold. Freeing. Relief. Carson Gates is a goalie at Chatham University. Sedona Prince now plays basketball for TCU. And Byron Perkins is a defensive back at Hampton University. They're all out now, but not too long ago, the ice rink, the basketball court, and the football field were overshadowed by the closet. It was very, very scary for me to, to come out. With my friends away from hockey, I could just be myself and be comfortable. But with the boys, I kind of had to change who I felt like who I was just to, you know, fit in a little bit. I kind of had to suppress my, my truth. When you're suppressing your truth, what's the impact of that? Self-hatred, really. Did that affect you on the football field? Very much so. I, I wasn't able to be as focused. So last year, Byron came out, becoming the first openly gay football player at a historically black college or university. When you did come out, what changed? A lot changed. My teammates, they didn't change, though. They still treated me with the utmost respect. Uh, my coaches approached me with the utmost courtesy. Do you remember your first game after you came out to your team? Yeah, I balled. <laughs> I balled. I was like, oh, yeah. Talk about the response from your teammates. <laughs> Um, we knew, you know, they, yeah, they always say that when people come out, it's like that, that thing of, oh yeah, okay, we knew. And it's like, oh, that relief. 
Carson came out publicly this year in an essay after some NHL players decided not to wear rainbow jerseys during their team's pride nights. Growing up in the game, there's the Efflers used very frequently by players and coaches at young levels, and I was hoping coming out that maybe a young player who is out to themselves at least that you know, they're not alone in the game. On social media, Sedona has nearly 3 million TikTok followers. In one of her videos, a father told Sedona that she inspired his teen daughter to come out. Um, been a, a very meaningful last uh, few, few weeks for us. And he's just like crying and seeing that from a dad was like, we're all bawling. The WNBA does have several openly out players, but men's major league sports are quite different. The NBA had Jason Collins, the NFL, Carl Nassib, while the NHL and MLB have never seen an active out player. Though times could be changing, in a recent out sports study of LGBTQ athletes in high school and college, 95% said their teammates' responses to them coming out were neutral to perfect. And it was very difficult to find an athlete that was not supported by their teammates when they came out. What's it going to take, you think, to see more pro athletes come out? More pro athletes coming out. Outsports' motto is courage is contagious. Sedona dreams of going pro, so do Byron and Carson. If either of you made it to the pros, you would maybe be known as the gay hockey player, the gay football player. And that's the player. problem, right? It's just like, we're not just our sexuality. We're more than our sexualities. It doesn't define who we are. It's a piece of us. It's a part of us. It's our identity, but it is not us. Like any athlete, they're defined by so much more. Wow, and our thanks to Joe Fryer for that report and for those three athletes for sharing their stories. And they tell us that they hope their stories will help spread acceptance, their advice to other athletes who are considering coming out. Take your time, look for mentors, and surround yourself with a safe and loving community. We're continuing our Pride coverage by taking a closer look at surrogacy within the LGBTQ community. Yeah, a recent polling shows 45 to 53 percent of LGBTQ plus people are planning to become parents for the first time, compared with about 55 percent of people who do not identify as part of that community. And while science has improved in family planning, LGBTQ people still face major hurdles when trying to have children. So let's bring in Brian Kelly. He's the founder of The Point Sky and father to Dean Kelly. We also want to bring in Dr. Uh, Syed Donishmond, who is a double board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, as well as obstetrist, obstetrist, say this word for me. Right? Obstetrics. Obstetrics, thank you so much, and gynecology. You can tell I'm not an expert. Brian, thanks so much for being here. We want to start with you. So yes. talk to us about your surrogacy journey. It's a very exciting stuff. What was the process well, like I've been you? on a lot of trips in my life, but I have to say this journey has been the most amazing, <laughs> but not without challenges. You know, I've, I've wanted to be a dad ever since I can remember. And when I came out in the 90s, my parents were very happy for me, but they were like, mm. you can't have kids. And we know that's... Ah. So it's been amazing to see out uh, celebrities, Andy, Cohen, Anderson Cooper, be single gay dad. So in 2020, when I was grounded and I couldn't travel, I said, you know what, this is a moment for me to actually start the journey. And I'm so fortunate. You know, my key recommendation is find an IVF doctor that is LGBTQ friendly. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I got introduced to Dr. Donishman and him and his team helped guide me through so much of the process. So my tip is start first with finding that doctor mm -hmm. who you trust, because this journey will have its ups and downs. Your son Dean there was so cute in front of the Eiffel Tower, was that? Oh yeah, that was on oh. Monday of this week. He's oh, been, wow. he has seven passports and he's eight months International old. International so traveler. I don't know adorable. if we can keep that up, <laughs> <laughs> but he, he loves it. Dr. Wow. Dadishman, let's go to you. What are some of the obstacles that LGBTQ couples face when choosing to have children via surrog surrogacy? And is LGBTQ family planning facing more backlash now compared to just a couple of years ago? That's a terrific question. Uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community faces heightened barriers uh, when it comes to fertility care, when it comes to family building. And part of the reason is because they don't meet the, the formal definition of, of infertility. And thus what happens is they have less access to care, they have less coverage for care. So what we have done over the past uh, 20, 24 years of my career is, is try to um, appeal to employers, to insurance companies, to make sure that there's coverage so we can increase access and also fertility care can be expensive so being able to actually have coverage for fertility care so we can help all 
uh, people, uh, build families, is really, really important to uh, a purpose that we have. And Brian, what about that topic? I mean, finances can be such a hurdle to people who do want to choose surrogacy. Are there methods for people who may not have the means? You know, it's crazy. I have really good health insurance. I'm so privileged. And even I was shocked at every twist and turn in the journey. Luckily, my employer, you know, they would cover the storage of the embryos. But I got hit with, you know, once I thought I was in the clear, my surrogate, who was amazing, she was in California, uh, when it came time for her to deliver, I got hit with a $50,000 hospital wow, bill wow. because she was not my wife. Or even wow. if, even if you know, if I was a straight man who had impregnated her, my insurance would cover it. So there's so many inequities, and it's really hard to even see down the full pipeline. Uh, but it's an expensive journey for sure. Um, there is an organization, Family Equality, which helps LGBTQ plus families. Um, you know, get the resources that they need and, and education. So I highly recommend them. But, um, you know, whether it's the getting an egg donor, and I will just say there is still discrimination in the process. I was going through egg donors, and there were some that would say, we're not going to do it for LGBTQ plus people. So wow. I just want to warn others out there. It exists. It kind of shocked me. Yeah. Um, I understand it, it exists, and it's, you know, every woman's right to choose, I guess, who gets their egg. You know, I, I, I can see that. But, uh, it's, it's a, still a tough journey. So be ready, do your research, and if possible, you know, connect with people who have been through the process. Hmm. And doctor, uh, what do you hear from patients during this process? Why is this so important for the LGBTQ community? You know, it's, it's family building. And uh, there's such a great desire and such a great value placed on, on having children, loving them. It's, it's a really a journey of love. And so what we try to do is, is, is help uh, increase access, uh, uh, help with coverage. As Brian said, people like Brian are really inspirational figures because what they do is they go out and they speak about their journey. They speak about some of the struggles during the journey, as, as Brian just mentioned to you. There's discrimination in, in sort of all aspects of this particular journey. Um, but there are organizations, like Brian said, like Family Equality, like uh, another organization that uh, we have supported for many, many years, or Men Having Babies, uh, where they increase access, decrease costs associated with family building. So I think we just all have to work harder and, and really inspired by people like Brian, who come out and talk about their journey. And of course, Dean, who uh, <laughs> is a world traveler now, and, and um, having Dean and, and Brian really um, out there um, uh, sort of uh, beating the drum on this particular uh, subject. It's really, really important to inspire others. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Dean, adorable there with that beret. Brian and <laughs> Dr. Syed Donishman, thanks both of you so much. And Valerie, thanks for helping me pronounce obstetrics. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Today is World Refugee Day, and Chicago is just one of the major U.S. cities grappling with the ongoing migrant crisis. According to the Chicago Mayor's Office, since August of last year, the city has provided sanctuary for more than 8,000 migrants housed across at least 10 different locations in the city. Now, one organization is using soccer to help rebuild some sense of community for some of those people. Otto Rodriguez, the Chicago Director of Street Soccer USA, joins us now. Otto, good morning. We understand you're overseeing a team that is playing in the Refugee World Cup tournament later today. Tell us how this all got started. Yeah, so it all got started uh, just by uh, connecting with one of my good friends from uh, high school who um, ran a church and he lived two blocks away from a new refugee shelter in the uh, uh, football community. And he was like, hey, I know you run this soccer program. Let's see, uh, let's see if we could do something here. And so I was like, yeah, let's just like a little soccer uh, games every Wednesday and, and Sundays, and it just started blowing up. And a lot of the migrants who are in the shelter have been uh, attending that um, just to kind of like relieve stress for themselves and, and to uh, just play the game. Soccer is such a worldwide sport. I know it means something to so many people. Tell us about some of the other people involved in the tournament. What are some of the countries represented and what have players been through just to reach this point? So they've, They've they've came from all most, all these uh, migrant uh, asylum seekers have come from Venezuela and uh, South American countries. Um, they've all came in uh, through the Texas border um, and have been bused here uh, as a sanctuary city. Chicago has been a sacred sanctuary city, and um, they've just been you know. Uh, uh, Waiting for their 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 uh, if see if their paperwork's going to go through or not, 
And so what we try to provide to, to them is just like that stress relief and also just that, you know, that sense of home uh, and community through sport. Um, just soccer is such a worldwide language. All you need is just the ball. And so we just we just provide that kind of a little bit of, you know, um, a sense of uh, relief for them. Yeah, they've, they've been through so much and uh, must have something to look forward to. It just must be so wonderful for that community. Otto Rodriguez, thank you so much for your time this morning. We have more now on the search for that tourist submersible that went missing while trying to get an up-close look at the Titanic wreckage. Now, more than a century after the ship sank, fascination with the Titanic is as strong as ever. With podcasts and exhibits to new documentaries, the public is captivated by that doomed ocean liner. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins us now in Boston with more on all this. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, and this is where the Coast Guard mission is based this morning. This was a very exclusive, a very expensive mission with five on board, including a Pakistani businessman and his son and a British world traveler. It must have seemed like a dream trip to go down to the bottom of the ocean and delve into the story of the Titanic. Now they are part of the mystery. The urgent search intensifying this morning to find the private submersible with five people on board. Coast Guard officials looking by air and sea for the Titan, designed for underwater tourism. Ocean Gate Expeditions, which operates the exclusive trips, started its Titanic voyages in 2021. Colin Taylor went on one last summer with his son. We spent four or five hours at the wreck itself. OceanGate uses the Starlink satellite to maintain an internet connection. And the underwater Titan team relies on text messages for guidance. And the text messaging is incredibly slow. So you're, uh, you're using a shorthand version of words to communicate with, with the ship on the surface. The OceanGate CEO explaining some more of the ship's mechanics in a CBS interview last year. We can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! It seems like this submersible has some elements of MacGyver-y jerry-riggedness. I mean, you're putting construction pipes as ballast. I don't know if I'd use that description of it, um, but there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not macgyver at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still going to be safe. The submersible, which holds five people, is just over 22 feet long, just over nine feet wide, and 8.3 feet high. The Titanic tourism industry has boomed since the iconic movie. And OceanGate's undersea exploration is one of the most exclusive experiences, coming with a price tag of 250000 for previous trips. We are making scans. The CEO telling NBC News in August, OceanGate has made some discoveries of its own with its high-resolution cameras. On the port side forward anchor, which has been photographed many times, we were able to pick up the manufacturer's uh, name. The Titanic uh, experts were super excited. But this morning, in those waters where the Titanic once sank, it's now a race against time. Now, more people have actually been to space than have gone down uh, to that depth. These were missions that were traditionally reserved not for tourists, but for researchers and scientists. OceanGate on its website, though, says it is conducting these missions in accordance with the underwater world heritage guidelines, meaning that they can go down to these sites but aren't allowed to disturb them at all. Uh, online, the company also posted an itinerary, which included two more trips scheduled for 2024. Guys, back to you. All right, Kristen Dahlgren, thanks so much. Now to financial headlines. A new initiative from large companies to hire European refugees and Ukrainian women is rolling out. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and more. Good morning, Silvana. Stephen Valley, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so several companies, including Amazon, Marriott, and Hilton, are pledging to hire more than 13,000 Ukrainian women and other European refugees over the next three years. Now, on this World Refugee Day, more than 40 corporations say they will hire, connect to work, or train a total of 250,000 refugees, with more than 14,000 of them getting jobs directly in those companies. 
A majority of black executives surveyed by CNBC say their companies have made positive changes in hiring, retention, and promotion of black employees since the death of George Floyd in 2020. However, though, the survey finds that there are still significant gaps related to the treatment of black employees throughout their organizations, as well as diverse representation and equal pay at the senior leadership level. Exactly half say there are still less opportunities for black employees than other workers at their companies. And hackers are threatening to release confidential information stolen from Reddit unless the company pays a ransom and reverses its controversial price hikes. A hacker gang called Black Cat claims to have stolen the data during a breach in February, and they say they want $4.5 million in exchange for the data. Reddit's new prices for access to data for third-party app developers prompted thousands of forums to go dark last week in protest, guys. Wow, that Reddit drama is intense. Ooh, oh, my God. Every, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm hearing something every day. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Thanks yeah. for keeping us updated. So, thank you so much. Turning now to the debate over artificial intelligence. While AI can be seen as a tool that can help with our everyday lives, it also has raised ethical concerns about privacy, bias, and misinformation. Today, President Biden is set to meet with a panel of AI experts to discuss the risks and areas of opportunities it presents. Yeah, this visit comes as lawmakers on Capitol Hill plan to introduce legislation to establish an artificial intelligence commission. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now from San Francisco with more on this. Jake, so what rules might lawmakers be talking about here related to AI? And more importantly, is artificial intelligence really something that can even be regulated? Well, Stephen, uh, experts have been saying over and over again that, yes, it absolutely can. And, you know, if you need evidence of that, you need look no further than Europe, which has already implemented rules that would categorize AI by risk level and outlaw certain high-risk forms of AI entirely. And that's what makes today's uh, proposed legislation from Congressman Ted Lieu and Ken Buck so interesting. I mean, those two are at the opposite ends of the ideological spectrum, but they have come together on this idea that we're going to create a 20-member commission that will have roughly two years to try to get some guardrails around AI? Could it be a federal agency uh, that perhaps uh, be begins to independently regulate it? Could it be something on the model of the risk uh, idea that the EU has put forward? We don't know, but it's definitely a, a very concrete step toward regulating something that has escaped uh, regulation almost entirely until now, you guys. Jake, let's talk about some of the main worries surrounding AI. Some people have raised concerns over the bias and misinformation that can come from this technology. We've reported on how AI was being used to scam people. Could regulation have any impact on those issues? Well, Valerie, what's so interesting about the meeting that President Biden is going to have today with experts is that until now, the people he's sat across from tend to be people who make money off of AI. But these are folks he's going to be meeting with today here in San Francisco who are very active, very vocal, and very smart critics of AI. It ranges from uh, Joy Bualamwi, who is a uh, expert in the, the ways in which AI can perpetuate discrimination and bias. She'll be able to tell him things about how, you know, if you uh, vacuum up the wrong piece of data in, uh, let's say, a, a bank, you could end up writing loans in a racist way and not even realize it. Um, or uh, he'll also be speaking, and I think this is one of the most interesting conversations he'll have, with Jennifer Doudna. She's the Nobel Prize winning biochemist who created CRISPR. It's a gene editing so, uh, technology that really uh, has incredible medical potential, but also can be very dangerous. And that's why that whole industry has essentially pulled back, created a moratorium on using this gene editing. That's a model where she'll be able to sit across from him and say, do not believe the idea that we can't put the genie back in the bottle. We've done it before. We absolutely can do it again, you guys. Uh, Jake, don't have a lot of time left, but on that same topic, there are good things involved in AI, including medical developments, possibilities for, for new medicines. Could this regulation possibly slow that down? Well, I think the way that experts talk about it, uh, you know, is that, yes, of course, there is tremendous potential around this. But um, in the case of healthcare, and I'm actually headed after I, I uh, speak to you down to Stanford to see one of many, many projects using AI in healthcare. I mean, it can do extraordinary things there, but we already have very good and strong regulations around medical privacy. Uh, you know, so the regulations that people are proposing right now would really just be the very beginning of getting some guardrails around AI at the moment. There is absolutely no data privacy, data transparency, or AI regulation on the books at all. If we're going to be anything like other Western democracies, it looks like we're going to have to regulate this stuff in some way, you guys. Mm. All right, interesting stuff. Jake Ward on the forefront of all things AI for us. We appreciate it.
breaking this morning. The trial date for former President Trump's federal indictment has now been set. The judge in the case has set the trial to begin in less than two months on August 14th. Earlier this month, Trump made history by becoming the first ever former president to be indicted on federal charges. The 37-count indictment alleges Trump knowingly and unlawfully kept classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in South Florida after leaving the White House. For his part, the former president pleaded not guilty. Welcome back. If you have an anniversary coming up and need to go gift shopping, maybe don't show your partner this story. Alexander Sway's girlfriend joked that she wanted an Hermes Birkin bag for her anniversary gift. Well, when the real estate agent found out that the real thing can cost six figures, he decided to make his own. So after spending $400 on leather and tools, he painstakingly took 60 hours to make the bag himself. His girlfriend said the bag made her realize just how much he cared for her. I'm glad that 60 hours of work is what it took. <laughs> yeah, learning a whole new skill. Oh Impressive. Gosh. Well, now we're into summer. Some of us have been enjoying the warmer weather outside, but step into a lot of workplaces and you wouldn't know it. In fact, you are more likely to see women layering up. Yeah, that's because some offices are icing out their women workers in particular. It's becoming a growing battle against the AC. Here's today's show anchor Jenna Bush Hager with more on what's known as women's winter. It's women's winter. Maggie actually has two blankets. Women's winter, when the outside temps are up, the office temps seem to plunge. There she goes. Freezing office dwellers taking to TikTok to complain. This little space heater right here, I've had it running more this week when it's been 85 degrees outside than I have the entire year. From space heaters to layer upon layer. Where do you keep your office sweater? Don't worry, the women on today's staff have plenty of them. So first I have this fleece. On top of that, I'll put this around my body, this on my legs, come down here, slippers, and a fleece blanket. But ask some of the men about the office temps. I think it feels warm. It's fine to me, short sleeves. It's the return of the thermometer wars following a return to the office after the pandemic. It's a fight we fought on air. Yeah, I said 70. Yeah. 75? That's oh. fine, you guys. Just I want you to be comfortable. Oscar, what are okay? we? <laughs> I want you to be comfortable. So let's get it down to 64. Oh. According to a 2021 study published in the Nature Journal, women are three times as likely to be uncomfortably cold in the office during the summer. And it's impacting our jobs. A separate 2019 study found as room temps warmed up from the 60s to the 70s, female performance on verbal and math tests actually increased by 15%. USC associate professor Tom Chang co-authored the research. Think about how hard firms try to, to coax out an additional percent or two of productivity for workers. And the thing that we found is just adjusting the thermostat a degree or two like gives them that performance boost. Men conversely test worse in warmer temps, but Chang found women were impacted a bit more by the cold. It seems like based on your findings, women and men need different temperatures. Is that right? I think the key takeaway is, is not one size fits all. I got notes from uh, older women who were in menopause and they said, you know, I used to always be on team. It's too damn cold. And mm -hmm. now I'm with the guys in the three piece suit saying like crank up the AC. <laughs> I think the thing to do is you need to listen to the people in your office and, and ask them like, is it too cold or is it too hot? And, and pay attention to that. I've got the two sweaters at my desk, one <laughs> for over and then one for my legs. Yeah, she does. We used to share an office. That's true. Thanks to Jenna Bush Hager for that reporting. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. News continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.